Come explore the worlds of National Geographic video. This program is made possible by a grant from the people of Chevron. We're proud to bring new worlds to your world. that walk this earth. They are the biggest, strongest, and among the most intelligent. Yet, they allow us puny humans to bend them to our will. They have served us and entertained us seemingly without complaint for thousands of years. Whether captive servants or free roaming lords of the wilderness, they are indelibly inscribed in human culture. Their glorious past prologue to an uncertain present and grim future. More than 300 years ago, poet John Donne wrote, nature's great masterpiece, an elephant, the only harmless great thing, the giant of beasts. Let us now behold the elephant. To one billion people, fully a fifth of the world's population, the elephant is sacred. In India, no other animal lives in such close contact with human beings. The one-to-one -one relationship between elephant and trainer, a mahout, often lasts a lifetime, for each is allotted about the same span of years. Yet here and throughout Asia, the impact of human numbers has decimated the elephant. In all that vast continent, fewer than 50,000 remain. The Asian elephant is officially designated an endangered species. Although domesticated about 5,000 years ago, elephants are not easily bred in captivity. Unlike horses or cattle or dogs, they remain biologically unchanged by man. But in human imagination and creativity, they are transformed in myriad and wondrous ways. Ancient Indian legends tell of Ganesha, venerated and loved by Hindu and Buddhist alike as god of wisdom, prudence, and good fortune. Down through the centuries, in cultures around the world, Folklore and art manifest the elephant in joyous fantasy.
What is an elephant? Actually, there are two species. Although not closely related in scientific terms, to most of us, they are a single animal. The African elephant is larger, with enormous ears, a sloping head, and concave back. Both male and female have tusks. The Asian has smaller ears, a bulbous head, and convex back. Tusks are seen only in males, but not in all of them. Ancestors of both species descended from Merotherium, creatures about the size of a pig that roamed northern Africa some 45 million years ago. Over eons, huge mastodons, mammoths, and other elephant-like creatures evolved and spread across Europe, Asia, and the Americas. During the last ice age, they were hunted by early man who painted their images on cave walls. Another of mankind's first works of art is equally old, a fertility symbol carved from the ivory tusk of a mammoth some 25,000 years ago. Today, only in shrinking areas of Asia and Africa do wild elephants survive. They live in highly organized family units led by the oldest female and composed of her sisters, daughters, and their young calves. Males leave the family at puberty. Elephants may stand 12 feet high and weigh up to six tons. To help control body temperature, they fan their huge ears where blood vessels that lie close to the surface can be cooled. The elephant's most distinctive feature is not an elongated nose, but a combination of nose and upper lip, with an incredible 100,000 muscles giving it limitless flexibility. The trunk is the most versatile appendage in all nature. The trunk easily holds some two gallons of water to be squirted into the mouth or showered over the body. Working like an olfactory periscope in dense foliage, it may detect and identify odors up to five miles away. For all their huge bulk, elephants are remarkably agile and move quietly through all kinds of terrain. Almost like dancers, they walk on their toes, supported by pads of fibrous fatty tissue that absorb the impact of each step. Often described as perpetual eating machines, elephants consume so much vegetation that they can destroy their own environment. Their inefficient digestive system excretes more than half of all they eat and their droppings distribute seeds and fertilizer for new growth. In the elephant matriarchal social order, bulls live apart, only approaching the herd to seek out females in estrus. A bull may follow an estrus cow closely for several days. His sense of smell tells him that she is receptive. While the cow may accept other males, it is usually the dominant bull who will pass along his genes to a new generation. Pregnancy lasts 22 months. Although they begin eating solid food at about six months, calves may suckle for two years or more. Their protection and education are the keystones of the elephant's family-bonded social structure. Born like humans with relatively undeveloped brains, elephants spend their long childhood learning the ways of their kind, wallowing in mud to give the skin a protective coating is but one bit of knowledge passed from generation to generation. Okay. 
elephants love water and bathe daily whenever possible to keep cool and to cleanse their sensitive skin of insects and parasites. Wherever they are, they touch each other frequently, thought to be a way of greeting or reassurance. Young males often engage in playful sparring, a test of strength that helps determine dominance later in life. Nothing about elephant behavior intrigues us more than their fascination with the remains of their dead. Here, perhaps, originated all those fanciful tales of the elephant's graveyard. Touching and smelling the remains of their own kind is interpreted by some as an attempt to identify the dead individual, an implication that within the elephant brain lives an awareness of death. While the similarities of Asian and African elephants far outweigh the differences, quite the opposite applies to their relationship with humans. Asians treat the elephant with respect. In the annual celebration of the midsummer full moon in Kandy, Sri Lanka, only an elephant is worthy of carrying the sacred tooth relic of the Buddha. The tradition is 1,600 years old. For much of this century, the honor of bearing the sacred relic has gone to Raja, a huge tusker officially declared a national treasure and given residence at Sri Lanka's holiest Buddhist temple. When he died in 1988, he was 82, the oldest elephant on record. Most domesticated elephants were captured from wild herds that once roamed throughout southern Asia, a practice no longer possible in most countries. An exception is Laos. Riding elephants especially trained for this work, hunters single out a healthy-looking five-year-old. Back in camp and tightly restrained, the captive must now be broken. It may take as long as a month. It learns the feel and smell of human flesh. For days at a time, it may be deprived of food and sleep and suffer repeated beatings. It is a time-tested ritual to break the elephant's spirit and force it to accept domination by humans. deal will go on until inevitably the elephant surrenders. Now the victors sing, good girl, don't forget what we have taught you. If you don't obey, we will feed you to the crows. Breaking is but the first step. Training continues for 10 to 15 years, for only mature animals like this big tusker in Sri Lanka can perform heavy labor. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. 
Responding to 30 different commands, the experienced elephant handles logs weighing a ton or more, combining brute strength with delicate precision. For centuries, elephant labor brought most of the world's teak and mahogany to market. Today, many of those forests have been worked out or replaced by farms and settlements of Asia's human explosion. Elephants and mahouts cannot find work. The elephant is losing its economic value. Even in Thailand, where it adorns the royal palace and has been intimately tied to national history and culture for 800 years, the elephant faces hard times. Twenty-two-year-old Sewang Jonjai Ngam may share his elephant's fate, for he is a member of the Suwe tribe in eastern Thailand. And for countless generations, Suwe men have earned a living by capturing wild elephants in the jungles of nearby Kampuchea. When war and political upheaval forced them to abandon hunting, the Suwe kept their elephants as pets and encouraged breeding. The Suwe have no written language, but for centuries their knowledge and techniques have been passed along from father to son. Soeng was trained by his father and uncle, and now he helps out as his young cousin begins learning the ways of the Mahout. Someday, Soeng and the others of his generation will bear full responsibility for keeping the tradition alive. Sawain's 74-year-old grandfather is the last Suwe hunter still alive. He delights in telling his sons and grandsons of the 60 elephants he captured during those heroic and glorious times. Once a year, the men of Suwain's family and other Suwe villagers load up their elephants and embark on a three-day trek through terrain their ancestors may have traveled in search of wild herds, daydreaming perhaps of times long gone when brave Suwe men captured elephants for the armies of Thailand's kings. Reaching paved roads a day's march from home, the cows carefully protect the young from roaring motor traffic. It is an arduous journey for Suwain and the others, but for townspeople along the way, the procession provides joyous and thrilling moments. Thirty miles from home, they reach their destination, the town of Surin. 
Here they will star in a two-day entertainment spectacle organized by the provincial government. Attracting visitors from around the world, the Sarin Roundup provides needed cash for owners of elephants that otherwise would be unemployed. Each receives about $80. Public address announcers describe the action in Thai and English. They are probably the best elephant catchers in Southeast Asia. A priestly blessing on capture ropes and lassos made of buffalo hide begins a reenactment of a wild elephant hunt. In olden days, it was a three-month adventure, governed by strict ritual and taboos observed by both the men off on the hunt and by their families back home. A tug of war between men and elephant begins with 50 soldiers and ends with 100. But the result is always the same. Unable to see directly below them, elephants use their trunks to locate obstacles. The hind foot always lands in the same spot as the front. Occasionally, the Suwe men play elephant soccer at home, one village competing against another. Although the match is just an exhibition, it is Sawin's favorite event of the roundup. He enjoys playing before a big audience and says he can feel his elephant respond to the excitement of the crowd. The presence of so many visitors offers an opportunity for the Mahouts to pick up extra money. After each performance, Sawain and the others gather in the center of town to sell rides to locals and foreigners alike. Prices are negotiable. The money earned this weekend may be the only cash they'll see all year. Merci, messieurs. Bye bye. The weekend over, Sawing starts the long walk back to the village. He thinks he'll be back next year, but hopes something better will turn up. A declining job market for trained elephants has forced some Mahouts to try their luck in the teeming streets of Bangkok, Thailand's capital. Walking under an elephant's belly brings good luck. And to a pregnant woman, 
three times under guarantees and easy delivery. The cost? About 50 cents. In Thailand, as in most Asian countries, the working elephant struggles to survive against overwhelming odds, a tidal wave of people and their machines. In Africa, the story is very different. With few rare exceptions, the African elephant has not been domesticated. Some were killed for food or ivory, but for most of their history, Africa's people and elephants have coexisted in natural balance. But Africa is no longer a vast wilderness. Human population grows by 50,000 every day. As in Asia, burgeoning cities and farms are squeezing the habitats of all wildlife. People who need land to feed themselves cannot look kindly at elephants that destroy their crops. Down through the ages, Africa has supplied most of the world's ivory. And for nearly two centuries, commerce in ivory and slaves went hand in hand. Then, as now, the Orient was a major consumer of raw ivory. Not only were African tusks more abundant than the Asian variety, their size and texture made them more suitable for carving. Today, worldwide demand for ivory is greater than ever, and the price has soared to about $70 a pound. Some African countries encourage a carving industry, perhaps with an eye toward Asia, where centuries of tradition have produced masterpieces of the sculptor's art. Appreciation of such exquisite work often makes us overlook the source of the raw material. In the mid-1980s, up to 80,000 elephants a year were poached, killed illegally, to satisfy the demands of the ivory trade. In Kenya recently, Two helpless calves, less than a month old, were rescued by park rangers after their mothers were killed. They were rushed to the home of author Daphne Sheldrick, noted for her success in raising orphaned wildlife. Six months later, they were thriving. That old saying, elephants never forget, it's not just something that rolls off the tongue, that's absolutely true. They have giant memories. In an elephant herd, they would be amongst lots of friends and relatives. They would never, ever be on their own, and they get terribly, terribly distressed if they left on their own, particularly ones that have had a traumatic beginning like these two. You know, the mother is shot, and you can imagine what an impact that must have had on them, and they will remember it all their life. Because elephants cannot tolerate the fat in bovine milk, Sheldrick had to devise a special formula based on products developed for premature human infants. Never out of sight of their keepers, the orphans must be fed every three hours around the clock. 
each consumes 50 pints a day. When you mother to an animal, and it's a long-lived animal like an elephant, you know what that animal is thinking. Elephants do feel and think just like we do. And they do have feelings. They, they are, do feel sad. They do feel happy. They have all the same sort of emotions that we have. So basically, they are just like human babies. Daphne Sheldrick and her late husband, David, became heroes of the conservation movement during his service as warden of Kenya's Tsavo National Park. Over the years, she has raised dozens of orphaned animals and returned most of them to life in the wild. When the elephants are a year old, which is in another six months' time, then I'm going to send them down to Savo because down there we have an erstwhile orphan called Eleanor, an elephant. We got her when she was two. She's now 29, fully adult. So I'm going to hand these two little elephants over to her when they're a year old and she will teach them how to be elephants. Uh, that's something I can't teach them. So that's, that's what I hope to do. Once, free-roaming elephants by the millions ranged over most of Africa south of the Sahara. Their numbers dropped as human numbers increased. But in the 1930s, there were still an estimated 10 million or more. Flying over the plains of East Africa, explorer Martin Johnson could report seeing 10,000 elephants in just two hours. Today, flying over vast stretches of the continent, Dr. Ian Douglas Hamilton often searches for elephants in vain. Author of a landmark study of elephant behavior and ecology, he now leads a campaign to discourage people from buying ivory. His census reports show a 50% drop in elephant population in the last 10 years. Fewer than 750,000 remain in all Africa and they're declining at 8% a year. The situation of the African elephant across the continent is really extremely bad. It's catastrophic and people don't seem to know about it. It's one of the most wasteful and appalling mammalian tragedies of the 20th century. And time and again, I now come to places where there are actually more dead elephants than live. In the old days, it used to be men with poisoned arrows or with spears. And today, it's men armed with sophisticated military weapons. These are professional ivory poachers, and they've got to be stopped. People say that ivory is essential for human culture, and it's been around for a long time. But at the rate things are going, there's not going to be any ivory in the future, because there aren't going to be any any elephants. If you really want to maximize ivory production, what you should do is to let the elephants grow old and to die naturally. Because the older an elephant is, the more ivory it puts on every year. In sight of Kilimanjaro, a tented camp in Kenya's Amboseli National Park has been home for 13 years to Cynthia Moss. Employing techniques pioneered by Douglas Hamilton, she's been able to identify every one of Amboseli's elephants, about 650 in all. Her unprecedented study provides detailed knowledge of elephant social structure and population dynamics. Elephants are very special animals. Well, they all have different characteristics and personalities. They have some many traits that are fascinating. And among them is their social organization, which is very, very complex, as complex as any of the primates. It will only be worth having spent the prime of my life devoted to elephants if I've actually been able to have made an impact in some way, to have maybe saved elephants from total disruption for another 20 years or whatever. I mean, it's probably all holding action anyway. But I think I will have 
made people aware of elephants, of the complexity of their lives and the intelligence of elephants and how special they actually are. They are my life. I would do a lot to try to save them. One of Moss's major discoveries was made in collaboration with Joyce Poole. Together, they identified in the African elephant a period of heightened male aggression and sexuality. Known as must, the condition was thought to exist only in the Asian elephant. Their observations became the basis of Poole's doctoral dissertation at Cambridge University. She, too, knows all the Amboseli elephants as individuals and is now studying their vocal communication. I'm trying to find out what all the different sounds that elephants make mean. We know of 25 different calls. When we look at the spectrograms of sounds that we've recorded, we actually were only aware of about a third of those calls. So there are many calls that are below our human hearing. Sounds too low for humans to hear are known as infrasound. An early encounter with the phenomenon involved an elephant given the name Shirley. After Shirley's family had gone about half a kilometer away, Shirley started to call them, and you can see here, she listened, and then she called and listened immediately afterwards, and there's, a, there's an answer right there. And it was interesting that um, I could, I know the call by, by ear, and you, I could tell that she was calling them, and I could see her listening afterwards, but I couldn't hear the answers that she received. The implications of low-frequency calls excite many scientists. In a project partially funded by the National Geographic Society, researchers stake out a man-made waterhole in Etosha National Park, Namibia. Co-director Catherine Payne, who formerly studied the songs of humpback whales, wants to learn how far elephant infrasonic calls can travel. Loudspeakers, more than half a mile distant, aim recorded calls toward the water hole. Dr. William Langbauer of Cornell University is co-director of the project. If we play this call at real speed, if you stand just a little ways away from the loudspeaker, you'll hear little or nothing. It will play the same call again at four times real speed, and uh, the call should start becoming audible. Hello, Combi. Hello, Derek. Uh, we've been good for about two minutes. You guys at the it? tower, Langbauer and Payne do not know when the playbacks will begin. Their job is to observe and record the elephant's reactions, if any. The playback is the call of a female in estrus, her way, perhaps, of attracting the largest and most dominant males. Two bulls, the only elephants at the waterhole, move directly toward the source of the sound. Many similar tests have convinced Payne and Langbauer that much of elephant vocal communication is below human hearing. They report the range of these infrasonic calls to be at least one and a half miles, and they suspect it may go as high as three miles. What is the function of such long-range capability? They seem to be able to coordinate their behavior 
very quickly and in ways that we can't understand unless we think there's some kind of signal being given. A whole group moving about, facing in all different directions, all of a sudden will come to attention and freeze. And we assume that this may have been coordinated by an infrasonic call. We're especially excited about it because very low frequency sound has the potential to travel long distances without getting lost in the environment. It seems to me that both the female groups, uh, especially in these moments when everybody holds still and freezes, uh, it seems to me that they, and it also seems to me that the males, spend a lot of time getting oriented. Heads high, ears fanned, scanning, and after a scan, well, then they go in one direction. Um, I think they are listening for other elephants, figuring out where their rivals are or perhaps where other members of their families are. This is a fantastic animal with an amazing a society that seems to be coordinated over some distances. Um, I think we may be in the process of finding out how that coordination is achieved. Believing elephants to be special creatures with intelligence and abilities not yet fully understood, Payne and others are convinced that each elephant life is precious and should be preserved. But there is another view, that elephants are part of a large ecosystem. And when too many are confined in too small a space, proper game management requires that the herds be culled. Some years ago in Rwanda, for example, 140 elephants were hemmed in by the steady growth of human habitation. They had no place to go, and their only food was farmers' crops. Reluctantly, the government took drastic action. More than 100 mature animals were killed. Calves were tranquilized and shipped to a national park. Today, in parts of southern Africa, size of elephant herds is controlled by cropping. Thousands are killed every year. There, too, the young are spared, translocated to less populated areas or sold to zoos around the world. In Tacoma, Washington, the Point Defiance Zoo has four African elephants. Their presence illuminates a problem that many zoo officials around the country don't talk about. Research biologist Roland Smith wants to bring it into the open. Elephants are dangerous. Um, you have to go in with them because you have to work on their feet. You have to wash them. There's, there's many things that you have to do, and they're so big. Many, many people are killed every year by elephants, and it's something that's not well known. They seem like the cartoon Dumbo, and they seem like very gentle, kind of passive beasts. And if they're trained properly, they are. But even more than just people getting killed, many, many people are injured by elephants in zoos every year. It's the words that you use, not the hook again. We just stay here long enough, and the baby elephant will To teach out. zoo personnel how to handle elephants safely, Point Defiance has engaged trainer Richard McGuire. He dispels the popular belief that because they have no history of domestication, African elephants cannot be trained. Like this, I can just reach down and grab this little teeny thing on this little handle on the front of his face. Good, steady. Watch, watch how easy this is. Down. It's part of the reason why I teach him also that I can hold the trunk. See where I'm coming from? Steady and watch his trunk relax. Beak, beak. Mentally, he'll relax if I can do that. Beak, beak. See, as soon as they moved, terrified him. Right? Still a wild animal. Just came out of Africa. It hasn't been bred in captivity, and it's still wild. This will not hurt the little elephant. Why are you doing that? I'm going to use this to hold him down. I'm going to tie his trunk up here. His trunk is down. His body can't get up. The longer I hold him down, the more panicky he gets. Nothing's happening to him. He's not being hurt right now. Steady. Now, 
This is where the work comes in. It's just a matter of putting this rigging on him. And now I'm going to get on this side, and he's going to get panicky again. But both these guys are going to hold him down. Steady. Fear. That's all it is. He doesn't realize that nothing's going to hurt him. Good. 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 I can use a broom. I could use a jacket. I could use my shirt. Anything to rub on him, just to, so that there's, there's contact with him, to show him that you're not going to hurt him. Steady. You see, I can tell you every time right before he gets nervous, because I know exactly how their little minds think. Half. Good. Steady. All right, we're finished. If it was afraid of us, it would run away. If it was terrified, it would run away, wouldn't it? If we had heard it, wouldn't it leave us right now? Who does it go to? Look, that's kind of the proof of it all. And you start them at the beginning, and they go to school properly. And when they grow up, you don't have them smashing people into the wall and running through gates. That's why there has to be some criteria set in the business that everybody does it sort of the same. Slow. Slow. So that one guy doesn't do it one way, and somebody else does it another way. And of course, the elephants are the ones that have to be the mind readers. Move up. Move up. Come on, move up. Go ahead, go ahead. Biologist Smith sees training programs like McGuire's as essential for the safety of zoo personnel who daily run the risk of elephant attack. That's good. See how you walked over the stake that time? Don't let them crowd out. They'll move out of your way. Good. Good. Very good, Will. The hook really doesn't mean anything if they don't want to do it. It kind of encourages them, but it doesn't... It's not going to make this elephant stand still, and it's not going to make this elephant lay down. She has to more or less want to do it. You cannot make African elephants do anything. Line, line back. Get over. Back. Get over. Get over. Back. Did you guys back up and give her some room? Good. Get over. Back. Good. Back. Back. Good girl. Good. See, once you put the rope on her, she knows exactly what she's supposed to do. She understands exactly what she's supposed to do. All right, half. Steady. Down. This is why people don't like African elephants. They are so smart, really. It's not because they're dumb. They're, they're intelligent. But what happens is guys get too rushed, and they want to just try to make them lay down. You can't make them lay down. You cannot do that. You are not strong enough to do that. <laughs> Steady. All right, half. Steady. All right, sit. 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 Feet. Feet. Sit. Sit. Feet. Feet. Sit. All right, good girl. You see, and that's control. That's what you're eventually leading to. That's what we eventually want. Then you've got it. That's trained. That elephant's basically done. At Washington Park Zoo in Portland, Oregon, a rarely photographed event is about to unfold. For 12 hours, a cow named Me Too has been in labor. Milk dripping from her breasts is a sign that birth is near. Oh, it's just streaming out. Her strange smell and behavior excite a young female who repeatedly inspects Me Too's vulva. The newcomer is a male, weight about 175 pounds.
Using trunk and foot, Me Too tries to help her infant to stand. Playing her trunk all over his body, inhaling his odor, fixes his identity forever in her brain. Although much elephant behavior must be learned, it is instinct that impels him to his feet. He must stand to reach his mother's nipple for nourishment, and in the wild, be ready to walk with the herd. Hampered by the wet and slippery surface of his artificial home, his struggle to rise is a struggle to survive. Six months later, the calf, now named Prince, is healthy and vigorous. Seemingly unaware that vegetables are for eating, he soon will learn. His mother and grandmother are there to teach him. Prince is the 24th elephant born in Washington Park Zoo in 25 years, the most successful breeding record in the world. Veterinarian Michael Schmidt sees zoo breeding programs as a safeguard against extinction. Concerned that diminishing populations of elephants in the wild will result in dangerously reduced genetic diversity, he's launched several projects to research elephant reproduction. In one study, blood from mature females is monitored for changes in hormone content to learn precisely the elephant's estrus cycle. When ovulation can be accurately determined, artificial insemination may be feasible. To correlate their technology with nature's way, Dr. Schmidt and his team expose the cows in turn to one of the zoo's three males. The bull's behavior would be a clear indication of whether the cow were in estrus. When you have the knowledge of the elephant's reproductive cycle, which we're just developing, then you have a powerful tool, and it can be used to successfully breed domesticated elephants, which really has never been done in their whole 2,000 plus year history. The world is shrinking around these elephants, and paradoxically, while they're dying out, they're overpopulating the areas that are left to them. So how do you deal with overpopulation in a dying species? It's a very difficult problem, and it requires the most exquisite tools that you can develop. Uh, you might be talking about birth control for an endangered species, of all things in order to preserve a group of animals temporarily to allow them to reach a level that they can sustain without the horrible alternative of always having to shoot or crop the excessive numbers of animals whose genetic uh, variability is gone forever once you do that and you can't ever get that back. Of all the four-legged creatures that walk this planet, they are the biggest, the strongest, the most revered, and the most vulnerable. Let us now, while there is still time, contemplate and behold the elephant.
coming soon from National Geographic Video. This is Ali's world, rich with mysteries and laughter, alive with danger and delights. And these are Ali's people. To outsiders, they are known as pygmies, but here in the jungle, the Baka stand tall. Through the eyes of one family, National Geographic presents a unique portrait of a people in harmony with their surroundings, in tune with the cycle of the seasons. Meet the Baka, people of the forest. Cheetah. In the short grass of Africa's Serengeti Plain, this is a season of plenty and fear. A time for growing up and growing strong. A moment of truth for the cheetah. Innocent, relentless, loving, deadly. Cheetah. With National Geographic as your guide, witness a timeless drama of life and death unfolding in this, the season of the cheetah. Contact. To reclaim a piece of the past is to make yesterday come alive. They are craftsmen and collectors, artisans and dreamers. They restore masterpieces of a not-so-bygone era. At $900,000, you would have made $1 million. I love to make discoveries. I like uh, nostalgic things. And hearing people talk about this old carousel, just hearing stories like that, that's, that's a thrill. It's a great, great feeling. This is history in the making. Join National Geographic and celebrate the crown jewels of a golden age of achievement with treasures from the past. National Geographic Video, undeniably collectible and affordably priced, only from Vestron Video. Continue your exploration of the world with National Geographic magazine. Get 12 monthly issues filled with the same kind of spectacular photography you enjoy in National Geographic videos, plus captivating stories on fascinating people and places, incredible animals, yesterday's world, and today's amazing science and discovery. You'll enjoy all this by becoming a member of the National Geographic Society. You'll also receive six valuable maps, and you'll support important scientific research like the Titanic expedition. To join, phone or write the Society at this address. <laughs>